Okay, unfortunately, <laughs> there were some serious recording issues for day 19. So I'm gonna go over the problem quickly and then show you my part one answer. But the process of getting to that answer is lost to the ether forever, <laughs> unfortunately. So day 19 is not enough minerals. Basically, we get a list of blueprints. We've got four robots. We get the blueprint for an ore robot. We get the blueprint for an ore robot, a clay robot, an obsidian robot, and a geode robot. Our goal is to build as many geodes as possible. The way we do that is going to be, in my case, recursion. There is this giant list of minute to minute for how one of the collections could go. And then at the end, we multiply the blueprint ID with the largest number of geodes that can be opened in 24 minutes. For part one, for the test, that means blueprint one can open nine and blueprint two can open 12, which gives us a quality level of 33, nine plus 24. Our puzzle answer for part one is 1147. So let's get into it. Now I do kind of a brute forcey approach. So let's start with the parser. So process part one right here. We've got the blueprints parser that returns us a vec of blueprints. We iterate over each of the blueprints in parallel using rayon. Talk about that more in a little bit. We enumerate over that to get the index as well as the blueprint. We use this step blueprint function, which takes a blueprint, a set of resources, which is the minerals and the number of bots and a time. This is a recursive function. So it just keeps stepping in and in and in until we get all the leaf nodes and then we collect them all back into a VEC. We're basically flat mapping all the results. So we end up with a VEC of resources, which results in an iterator of resources here. We map over those for each blueprint. We get only the geode count. We get the maximum geode count from the VEC that we've calculated. We unwrap that. And then we do the little bit of math that we have to do index plus one because we are zero indexed, but the IDs are one index times the max. And we sum those into a U size. So the parser is right here. It's a blueprints takes an input string slice. We use nom again. We've been using nom for a number of days now. This returns a VEC of blueprints. So it's a separated list, line ending blueprint. Every blueprint is on its own line. We have a couple of helper structs here. We've got obsidian requirements and geode requirements. Those fit into a blueprint. So we've got the ID of the blueprint. We've got the amount of ore that we need to build an ore bot. We've got the amount of ore that we need to build a clay bot. We've got the requirements to build an obsidian bot and the requirements to build a geo bot. We do basically a bunch of delimited parsers for this. So we do a delimited blueprint, complete U64 tag, same thing for the next one. So there are basically like the title blueprint one or whatever, and then a number of sentences. So we do delimited first part of the sentence, the value we want, and then the second part of the sentence. And we do that a couple of times. We use that same approach, but replace the U64 with a custom parser that is a separated pair for getting two values from one of the sentences. So we get a U64 and another U64. And we map over those to get either obsidian requirements in the first example or geode requirements in the second. And that gives us back our blueprint. So once we have our blueprints, we do par iter here. Par iter, basically, the only thing we need to do to turn this parallel is to go from blueprints.iter to blueprints.paritter. Par iter comes up here from Rayon. So we needed to bring in a couple of traits. Those traits extend what we can do, add a couple of functions, and one of them is par iter. What this means is that then we spawn a bunch of threads and we do each of the uh, blueprints in parallel, which for part one is very useful, although the runtime that we get here is not terrible either. We could actually just have let it run, uh, but it does give us a significant improvement in runtime. So for example, if we do the test function, that might run in 30 seconds for uh, the test of two blueprints, but with par iter, it runs in 15 seconds. So you can see how parallelizing that helps, especially when we get to the actual problem, which is 30 blueprints. Now, the next interesting part is this step blueprint function. So it takes a reference to the blueprint that we're working on. We have a struct called resources that we initialize to the default value, and we have a number of minutes. Resources is all of our resources. So it's the number of bots here, ore bots, clay bots, etc., and the number of minerals, ore, clay, obsidian, etc. Judging by how much memory we use, we could probably represent this struct in a better way. I think that's the big uh, issue with this problem in part two later is just how much memory it uses to store 
all of the possible iterations. Now on resources, we have a number of functions. So if we go back down to step blueprint, this is our recursive function. We use checked sub with a value of one on time left. Time left is a U size, so it can't go below zero, but it has this function checked subtraction and checked subtraction will let us remove one from time. And if it's successful at doing so, if it's not below zero, if it doesn't underflow, then we get this time value in a sum wrapper. If it does underflow, then we get to call else, we get a none value basically, and we get to call else and we just return the resources. The return value here is a vec of resources because we can flatten vex into each other basically. So we can return from all of these recursive calls, a single vec. So we do have to do a number of heuristics here to try to cut down the number of branches that we actually calculate. So one of the ways that I figured works and does actually work out for us in part one is that we can try to buy one of the more expensive geode or one of the more expensive bots. So in this case, we match on resources.trybuildgeode for the geode bot, the obsidian bot, and the clay bot. Each of these returns an option, so we match on that and we ignore the others. So in this case, it's some resources and dot dot kind of just globs everything else. If the first one succeeds, then we use it. So we buy a, a geode bot. Otherwise, it's none and then we buy an obsidian bot. Otherwise, it's none, none, and then we buy a clay bot. Otherwise, it's just none. Like we don't buy any of them. Try build geode, try build obsidian, try build clay, and then also later on try build or are all basically the same function. If I had written resources or blueprints as a hash map, I think we could have actually written a single function that handled this all, but I didn't do that. So we end up with try build geode, for example. And this is where a couple of our heuristics live as well. So let's go over try build geo first. Try build geode bot takes a blueprint and a reference to the resources that we have available. So this is all of the minerals and the number of bots we have. If we have enough ore and we have enough and we have enough obsidian according to the blueprint, then we can create a geode bot. And this is one of the key insights. If we can build a geode bot, it is best to buy that geode bot. There's no point in waiting uh, to buy a geode bot if we can build one because we're only wasting like time basically that we could be running that geode bot. So if we can buy one, always buy one. Then we clone the amount of resources that we have into a new struct. We remove the cost of building a geode bot. So that's the ore from the blueprint and the obsidian from the blueprint. We subtract those from our resources. Then we do run, which is a general calculation for taking the number of bots we have for each category. And each bot produces one of its given uh, mineral type. So one ore bot would equal one ore. So we just add the number of bots to the relevant mineral type. And then finally, our geode bot is built at the end of the turn and we add one to the geode bot. Assuming all of that succeeds, we return the resources from this try build geode function. If it doesn't succeed or we shouldn't buy one, then we return none. So that's all fine, but we also have some heuristics built in here, especially for the obsidian, the clay, and the ore. So you'll see this extra part of the if expression in each of these. For the ore bot, for example, we check to make sure that we don't build more ore bots than are required to buy one of the other bots. So for example, we always need ore for any of the other bots, for clay, for obsidian bot, and for geode bot. If it costs three ore to buy a clay bot, four ore to buy an obsidian bot, and three ore to buy a geode bot, then this makes sure we don't build any more than four ore bots, because it's not useful for us to do that. If we're only buying one bot per turn, and we already have enough ore bots to generate that much ore every turn, then making more ore doesn't matter. It's not useful for us. So there's that heuristic built into each of the different types. Um, and that expression is different for each of the types. So this is a max of each of the other ore prices for the other bots. This is if we have uh, clay bots fewer than the number of clay bots that we need to buy an obsidian bot and so on. Otherwise, these functions are the same thing. It's also worth noting that when we implement default for resources, the default for a U size is zero. So we leave all of these at zero. We start off with one or bot when we start this whole process. So that's why we manually implement default instead of deriving it. So after we've tried to buy a geode, obsidian, or a clay bot, this new resources will tell us whether we were successful at doing that. It's an option resources. And then we take three paths from there. We try to build an ore bot in the same way that we did the other three. If we were able to build one of the other three, we continue with that using step blueprint. 
and we always continue running even if we didn't buy anything. So resources here returns an option the same way that new resources is an option here. We can map over an option, which will give us the interior value, which we can change into a step blueprint. So what happens is that this value will either be none or some VEC of resources. This value will also be either none or some VEC of resources. This value will always be some VEC of resources. So we iterate over that three element list. We filter out any of them that are none, and then we flatten those VECs into a single VEC and we collect them. So we end up with one VEC with all of the leafs or all of the return values from these three step blueprints. So each of the step blueprints returns its own VEC. We flatten those VECs into a single VEC and we return that from step blueprint. And that's how we recurse into and get all these values. It's not the most interesting solution. Um, there's some work that needs to be done to get it to work for part two, but that is the solution for part one, day 19 that I came up with. I especially wanna point out how easy it is to use Rayon. So if you need to parallelize something, you can cargo install Rayon and use something like par iter or uh, par iter bridge or something like that, I think it's called, to turn your iterators into parallel iterators. And this can speed up your computations, which is wonderful because if each of these took 30 seconds and we have to do 30 of them, then we end up with about 15 minutes worth of processing. If I'm doing that math right, 30 seconds, 30 blueprints, over 60 seconds per minute is 15 minutes. Whereas if we parallelize it, we could get that way down, right? If they each take 30 seconds and we run, say, 10 of them at a time, then we're done in three minutes. So it's worth parallelizing when we can. In this case, we can. It's really useful. And each of the blueprints acts independently. So that's why we can parallelize it. Unfortunately, the same solution isn't optimized for part two, which expands into 32 minutes. Um, it doesn't do 30 blueprints. It only does three blueprints, which we can access like this. So if we do blueprints.iter, it's over all 30 that we parsed out of the input. If we do blueprints 0 0.3, it only uses the first three because we can iterate over a slice of the blueprints. So 32 minutes expands this a little bit beyond uh, how I've optimized it, but otherwise uh, this would produce <laughs> a solution if it were allowed to run forever. So I hope you enjoyed day 19. I have, as far as I can tell, fixed the recording issue. I just, I basically just didn't restart my laptop for the last two months and eventually it was too much for the laptop. I do a DaVinci Resolve project every day that uses like 48 gigs of memory or something like that when it's rendering because it just uses everything. And then I also have Photoshop running and I also have other things running. So it was just too much. <laughs> but we've restarted the laptop. The uptime has gone from 62 days to half an hour. <laughs> and I'll see you tomorrow for day 20. We've only got seven days left. Not, not that many more problems. I guess six days now. <laughs> have a great rest of your day.